Hey there, fellow garden enthusiasts and farming friends. Have you ever wondered why some farmers grow different plants side by side in the same field, while others switch up what they grow each season? It's not just about keeping things interesting. These age-old farming techniques, intercropping and crop rotation, have been helping farmers boost yields and protect soil health for centuries. But which one is right for your garden or farm? What if I told you that the secret to doubling your harvest might be hiding in these traditional farming methods that many modern farmers have forgotten? Stay with me, because today we're diving deep into these game-changing approaches that could transform your growing space. We've split this guide into four parts to make it easy for you. In the first part, we'll discuss what intercropping is and how it works. In the second part, we'll explore crop rotation and its benefits. In the third part, we'll compare intercropping versus crop rotation head-to-head, -head, looking at their pros and cons. And in the last part, we'll hear expert opinions from Sarah Johnson, a fifth-generation farmer from Iowa, whose sustainable farming practices have earned her recognition from the American Sustainable Agriculture Association to help you decide which approach might work best for your situation. Part 1. What is intercropping? Let's start by understanding intercropping. Simply put, intercropping means growing two or more different crops together in the same field at the same time. Imagine planting rows of corn with beans growing between them, or lettuce growing under taller tomato plants. It's like creating a community of plants that live and grow together. But why would farmers want to do this? Well, intercropping takes advantage of the natural relationships between different plants. Some plants are tall and some are short, allowing them to share space without competing for sunlight. Some plants have deep roots while others have shallow ones, so they can access nutrients from different soil layers. And certain plants can actually help their neighbors by repelling pests or enriching the soil. One classic example of intercropping is the three sisters method used by Native Americans, where corn, beans, and squash are planted together. The corn provides support for the beans to climb, the beans fix nitrogen in the soil that feeds the corn and squash, and the squash spreads along the ground, suppressing weeds and keeping the soil moist. It's a beautiful partnership where each plant contributes something valuable to the others. Intercropping also creates diversity in your field, which helps reduce pest problems. When pests that prefer one crop try to spread, they encounter plants they don't like, which slows them down. This can significantly reduce the need for pesticides. Plus, having different plants with different flowering times attracts beneficial insects throughout the growing season, which helps with pollination and controlling harmful bugs. Another benefit of intercropping is more efficient use of resources. Different plants may need different nutrients or amounts of water, so they're not all competing for the exact same resources. This can lead to higher total yields from the same piece of land. Some studies have shown that well-planned intercropping systems can produce up to 50% more from the same area compared to monoculture, growing just one crop. Part 2. Understanding Crop Rotation Now let's shift gears to crop rotation. Unlike intercropping, Crop rotation is about changing what you grow in a particular field from one season or year to the next. It's like having different guests occupy the same room at different times, rather than having them all stay there together. With crop rotation, you might grow tomatoes in one section of your garden this year, then plant beans in that same spot next year, and perhaps corn the year after that. The key is to follow a planned sequence of different crops, typically rotating between plant families that have different characteristics and needs. Why is this important? Different types of plants affect the soil in different ways. Some, like corn, are heavy feeders that deplete soil nutrients. Others, like legumes, beans, peas, clover, actually add nitrogen back to the soil. Some plants develop deep root systems that break up compacted soil, while others have shallow roots that don't disturb the soil structure. By rotating crops, you create a balanced system where each crop helps prepare the soil for the next one. After a heavy feeding crop has used up nutrients, you might follow with a nitrogen-fixing legume to replenish the soil. This natural cycle helps maintain soil fertility without relying heavily on synthetic fertilizers. 
Crop rotation also helps break pest and disease cycles. Many pests and pathogens are specific to certain plant families. If you grow the same crop in the same spot year after year, these problems tend to build up in the soil. But when you rotate to a different crop family, those pests find themselves without a suitable host and their populations decline. This is a simple but effective way to manage many garden and farm problems naturally. Additionally, different crops can help manage weed problems. Some plants naturally suppress weeds through shade or chemical compounds they release. By including these in your rotation, you can reduce weed pressure for future crops. This strategic planning can significantly reduce the need for herbicides and the labor involved in weed control. Part 3. Intercropping versus Crop Rotation Head-to-head -head Comparison Now that we understand both techniques, let's compare them directly. First, it's important to note that intercropping and crop rotation aren't mutually exclusive. Many successful farmers use both, but they do have different strengths and challenges. When it comes to space efficiency, intercropping has a clear advantage. It allows you to grow more types of plants in the same area simultaneously, which can be particularly valuable if you have limited growing space. Crop rotation, on the other hand, requires you to dedicate your entire growing area to specific crops each season, which might limit variety at any given time. For managing soil fertility, both approaches have benefits, but in different ways. Intercropping can provide immediate benefits when companion plants support each other's growth, like when nitrogen-fixing beans grow alongside nitrogen-hungry corn. Crop rotation takes a longer view, building soil health over seasons and years by alternating between different types of crops with different needs and contributions. Pest management is another important consideration. Intercropping creates biodiversity that can confuse pests and provide habitat for beneficial insects. Crop rotation, meanwhile, disrupts pest life cycles by removing their host plants from a location for extended periods. Both approaches reduce pest problems, but through different mechanisms. Labor and management requirements differ too. Intercropping can be more complex to plan and implement initially. You need to carefully consider which plants will work well together, proper spacing, and how to harvest when you have multiple crops growing in the same space. Crop rotation requires careful record keeping and planning across seasons, but each individual planting may be simpler to manage. In terms of risk management, crop rotation may have an edge. By diversifying what you grow across seasons, you're less likely to lose everything to a single pest outbreak or weather event. However, Intercropping also provides risk benefits by ensuring that if one crop in your mix fails, others might still succeed. Part 4. Expert Insights To get some practical perspective on these approaches, I spoke with Sarah Johnson, whose 200-acre farm in central Iowa has become a model for sustainable agriculture in the Midwest. Both intercropping and crop rotation are essential tools in my farming toolkit. Sarah explains, but which one I emphasize depends on my goals for a particular field and what problems I'm trying to solve. Sarah recommends that beginners start with a simple crop rotation plan. Rotation is generally easier to implement when you're just starting out. Begin with a basic three or four year rotation plan, keeping good records of what grows where. Once you're comfortable with that, you can start experimenting with intercropping within your rotation plan. For home gardeners with limited space, Sarah suggests focusing more on intercropping. In a small garden, intercropping lets you maximize variety and yield. Try classic combinations like tomatoes with basil or carrots with onions. Just be sure to research compatible pairings before planting. When I asked Sarah about the biggest mistakes she sees, she emphasized planning. The biggest mistake with both techniques is lack of planning. With intercropping, you need to consider height, spread, and harvest times. With rotation, you need to track what was planted where and understand plant families. Either way, a little planning goes a long way. Sarah's final advice resonates with both new and experienced growers. Don't be afraid to experiment, but start small and observe carefully. 
These techniques have been refined over thousands of years of farming, but every piece of land is unique. Your own observations will ultimately be your best guide to what works in your specific conditions. So, whether you choose to focus on intercropping, crop rotation, or a combination of both, you're tapping into ancient wisdom that can help you grow more food with fewer inputs while building healthier soil for future seasons. Your plants, your wallet, and the planet will all thank you for it. That's it for today's comparison of intercropping versus crop rotation. If you found this helpful, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more practical growing tips. Until next time, happy growing!